negative ways. Uh, uh, generally speaking, quite negative ways. Uh, wasps are not seen as our friends. They're usually seen as sort of thugs. I, I've picked a few screen grabs here, but I could have picked some quite offensive screenshots. I'm sure you've all seen sort of the anatomy of a wasp kind of um, images and, uh, you know, honeybee, bumblebee, wasp with various sort of uh, unpleasant descriptions down the side of them. They are not particularly well liked. Um, generally speaking. Um, so Siri and Sumner, along with some colleagues back in, in 2017, I think, did some work to find out if people actually really did hate wasps. I mean, it's the most common question I'm asked, actually, is what's the point of wasps? Um, that is literally the most common question I'm asked. And I, I would say I'm probably asked it almost, almost daily. Um, people really don't get on with them. And, and what Siri and colleagues did was to, was to ask a series of questions. And they did lots of analyses of those questions. Um, but one of the things that they were able to do was to create word clouds from some of the qualitative responses that people gave. And you can see the word clouds here for four different types of insects. And in fact, if I bring up what the insects are, you'll, you'll see some of the problems here. If you ask people about bees, um, generally speaking, the first thing they'll say is honey, um, even though actually the insects that they're usually thinking of are bumblebees. Um, if you show them a picture of a honeybee, they often think it's a wasp, interestingly. Um, but the words that come out are, are positive words. Um, flowers, their, their colours, which are nice, you know, yellow, pollination, cute, fuzzy, which again is the conflation with bumblebees when you're talking about honeybees, hive, honey. Um, somebody's written stitches. I'm not quite sure uh, what they're meaning there. Um, useful is coming up and so on. Summer. Um, these are generally positive words. Um, if you ask them about butterflies, you get beautiful, pretty, wings, delicate, flowers, very, very positive associations. Um, if you ask them about flies, which again is um, kind of a, a rather crass term <laughs> given the diversity of diptera, but if you sort of ask people what they think of flies, they're generally thinking of house flies and annoying maggots, dirty wings, buzz. You have to go through the very, very small words in there to find anything positive at all. And then when you ask them about wasps, it's the same story. The, the, the word that comes up most is sting. Um, and then after that, we get annoying, angry, um, hard, <laughs> sugar centered. I'm not sure what, what that's coming from. Stitches appears again, which is interesting. Um, trouble, someone's obviously had a, a very, very bad encounter with social insects. Um, you've got troublesome, um, scary, all these sorts of associations. So there are very, very negative connotations about wasps for people out there. Um, What's interesting is that, I mean, I've been stung hundreds of times, mostly by honeybees. Um, honeybees sting, bumblebees have a particularly painful sting. I think quite frequently honeybees bother people around pub beer gardens and people think that they're wasps. Um, but honeybees sting as well, they can be perfectly annoying. And yet the good that we perceive honeybees to do greatly outweighs the bad. And the problem I think with wasps is that the good that they do is essentially either very poorly researched or just not known by the general public. So people have this association with wasps that's incredibly negative. Um, what they don't realise and what a lot of people don't realise is, is that, that wasps are incredibly diverse. Um, when, when I'm talking about wasps in this talk, I'm talking about the social wasps, I'm talking about the vespids pre predominantly, um, the vespula species mostly in, in this country. Uh, but of course, there's a huge diversity of wasps across the world, including some of the smallest multicellular animals that we have. Um, the, the fairy wasp here next to a um, next to a single cell protist. I mean, these things are tiny. Um, the massive and mighty Pepsis, huge wasp. The first time I saw one of these um, gigantic um, wasps was in um, Brazil. And I noticed that everyone that well, I was with a small group of about five or six of us and we all stumbled and um, we, 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 we were quite sort of taken aback by that and we, we came up with the idea that perhaps our brains had thought that that wasp was much closer than it was and that the ground was was much closer because they're so massive um, they're very bizarre things when you see them flying around they're just that they, they appear too big for the environment but of course you've got parasitoid wasps and and beautiful these beautiful leaf galls and all of these and and the paper wasps make these fantastic nests so there's lots of natural history stories around wasps which weave a really fascinating story you've got fig wasps as well of course you've got all of the the sort of agriculture cultural links and things so there's plenty there for us to get our teeth into when it comes to talking to people about wasps and and telling them that they're more diverse than people think but but then we've got the major problem that we come back to which is mostly what people are thinking about and worrying about and, and associating the word wasp with other social wasps um, and they are wonderful architects and so on but they do still sting and they can be quite annoying so you know we have to be careful that we don't sort of uh, 
we, I think we need to be quite open about that with people when we talk about wasps. I think we, we need to be sort of open and say, yes, they can actually be incredibly annoying, but you can make them less annoying by behaving and changing your behavior and actually look at all these other benefits. Um, so we've got wasps as natural pest controllers, uh, which I think is a story that, that does hit home, particularly for people that are keen on gardens. Um, we've got all sorts of estimates now of the, the amount of, of sort of pest uh, organisms and caterpillars, particularly that, that they take off both crops and, and gardens. So they are incredible pest controllers. And also, of course, as predators, they're at the top of a lot of these trophic interactions and, and having predators in ecosystems increases diversity. It stops particular prey species from becoming um, dominant and so on. So wasps have this really important ecological role, but also a sort of ecosystem service to us in terms of, of pest control. And that does seem to be a, a story that people can at least uh, get hold of and, and sort of appreciate. And if you look here, there's been there's been some research on this, um, quite a lot of research actually, and you can see the sorts of diversity. And I'm not going to go through all these interactions, but you've got three major predatory species of wasps or, or groups of wasps at the bottom here, and you've got the different um, orders that they that they're known to prey on. And you can see the vespines particularly, but also some of the um, the, the paper wasps, there, the plistines, are really quite significant. Um, predators when it comes to Diptera, Lepidoptera, Hymenoptera, um, some of the, the more common, you know, sawflies and so on, and, and also Orthoptera, actually, some of the more common crop species, um, crop pests. So definite role there for, for wasps as, as sort of biocontrol agents. And, and one of the things that particularly helps with that is that they're generalists. They're not particularly fussy what they take. Um, they're just as happy to take meat off your ham sandwich as they are to take meat off a, a standing crop. So they're actually able to take quite large quantities of pests in quite significant ways, and they're not too fussy about it. So that's quite good. We also know that wasps are pollinators. Um, this isn't a role that's usually associated with wasps. That's something that honeybees have, have, have owned, um, despite, you know, basically being very well adapted uh, nectar thieves and pollen thieves um, in terms of sort of efficiency of pollination. Actually, the solitary bees are far better, but of course, honeybees have strength in numbers. Um, bumblebees have, have, have that sort of advantage as well. And within the diptera, the hoverflies are almost certainly you know, important or more important pollinators. But we do know that wasps have a role in pollination. Um, we know that they're quite generalist. They're not visiting particular flower types, but they will visit them. Um, and we can think of them as sort of backup pollinators that are, are complementing the activities of bees and, and some of the diptera and so on. Um, again, actually pollinating, the pollinating role of wasps is something that we are you know, less knowledgeable about. This is some early work that's been done on here, looking at wasp family and plant family associations. So where we see um, the potential for pollination. Um, and you can see there's really quite a diverse range of of flowers that they will visit. Now, um, Siri and I have extended that work actually this year. Uh, we set up a, a project where we're getting people to submit to us images of wasps on flowers. Um, and we've got quite a large number of those now. We're working with sort of um, iNaturalist and some people in the States to start building up a much better idea of these wasp flower associations, both looking at the types of wasps. So we're not just interested in social wasps, actually any wasp on any flower will do for us. Um, and in some cases, as we'd hope, the images are clear enough for us to be able to zoom in and actually see whether or not pollen is on the surface of the insect and so on. It's it's very much a first stage. You know, we're going to have to assemble all of this, all, all of these data together, and it's going to in, in sort of inspire and influence further work. But we can already see that that some of the flower networks that they're visiting are, are much more diverse than we thought. So they do have a role in pollination, but it's a role that we're still trying to understand. And then if we ask the public about sort of, you know, the value, if we ask them directly, well, what do you think is the ecosystem service value of particular animals? And we have to frame it in couch in a way that obviously people can understand. Um, what we find is that as we might predict, um, bees up here, so they're slightly tricky to, to read graphs here, but the ecosystem sort of uh, rating here actually goes up to 10. That's basically the best you can get, right? And if you ask people about bees, honeybees particularly, the pollination value is as good as you can get. People know that bees are pollinators. Interestingly, if you ask people about wasps, um, I was expecting this number to be lower. Um, there does seem to be some idea that they might be pollinators, but it's a, a generally much lower value that people have. But if you ask people about predation, well, bees are 
I think most people sort of seem to know that bees are vegetarian, essentially, and that they don't predate. There's increased knowledge that wasps are predators. But I don't think a lot of people really fully understand that wasps are predators. I think people think that wasps have evolved to, you know, eat picnics. <laughs> um, there doesn't seem to be quite as much knowledge there. So there's definitely some opportunity for us to, to tap into that and to try and get some good stories going. Sorry, my screen's a bit cluttered here with lots of different Zoom um, applications. Let's see if I can get the other graph up. Here we go and shift, shift this over so I can see it. Um, and then what we can do is we can ask people um, just general, you know, how valuable do you think these are? And we can ask people uh, lots of questions about themselves and about what their interests are, because you know, the expectation is that as people are more interested in nature, perhaps their knowledge of the ecosystem value of different organisms or their perception of that value may increase or decrease or so, and so on. Um, two real striking things about this. This is the ESV rating at the side and people's self-rated interest in nature along the bottom. Um, regardless of your interest in nature, whether you don't care about nature or you are the most committed nature loving naturalist entomology sort of junkie anywhere, everybody knows bees are important and they perceive them to be important and they will report them to be important. On the other hand, if you sink down to wasps, there is a small uplift at the end for the real sort of nature buffs down the bottom. But in general, most people are, are the same. It's sort of more or less flatlined and it's considerably lower. So wasps are not perceived as being particularly important. They're certainly perceived as being much less important than honeybees. Um, and interestingly, that level of importance is only slightly influenced by your interest in nature. And that sort of trend is actually to some extent mirrored by the scientific community as well. This is the cumulative number of publications um, on different organisms. Um, we've got sort of bees, we've got other things, and then we've got wasps. Wasps are not really showing the same uplift that we've seen in, in particularly other types of pollinators. Um, so these are the number of scientific papers published on wasps. Uh, there's just a steady increase, as you'd expect. But actually, you may expect there to be more than that because we're seeing more and more papers being published. There's an exponential increase in the level of publication. But wasps are just slowly sort of creeping up. Uh, if you look at conference talks, so Syrian did a, a study where she looked at um, submissions to the International Union for the Study of Social Insects, the IUSSI um, conferences across time. Uh, bees slowly increasing, um, wasps <laughs> pretty much decreasing. So the public aren't particularly interested in wasps and don't particularly have a high regard to their value. And scientists aren't particularly publishing a lot, a lot of data and information on wasps and they're not particularly interested in talking about them at conferences either, uh, which is an interesting, an interesting phenomenon. So we have a fairly serious problem. We have a lack of public appreciation of wasps value and we also have an underlying fairly vigorous dislike of wasps, um, coupled with the fact that wasps are actually unpopular as a scientific topic with scientists, and therefore the sort of value and ecosystem service value of wasps has been pretty much um, understudied, particularly in comparison to other organisms. And of course that feeds into it because people are not getting the stories out because the stories don't exist, right? We can't communicate what we don't know. Um, so there's that sort of issue. So how can we solve that? Well, what we need is something that can boost the public image of wasps. We need more public outreach based around wasps. We need to try and develop a positive image of wasps in the media. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And one way that we can do that is to have direct involvement with the public in wasp research. So very much to, to the citizen science approach that we've seen successfully run with all kinds of other things. And of course, that feeds into the fact that we may start generating more interest in scientific study of wasps. Um, we can look at more sort of diverse applications for funding and all sorts of other things and different types of experimental approach. So the idea is very simple. We need a solution that comes up with it. Um, and the impact would be, of course, that hopefully we would have better stories to share. We'd have better data and better kind of sense of the ecosystem service value of wasps to be able to tell people about them, which hopefully might lead to more of an appreciation. And who knows, maybe also um, a little bit less public um, dislike of it and, and some more study. So that was really the sort of sense that we kind of started to develop the big wasp survey. Um, the idea of the Big Wasp Survey is to, is to try and enhance the information that we have about wasps, but also to provide a platform for engaging with the media and the public um, to get more information out there. Um, right, I've got just to move a few of these bars again. Okay, so 
that's our sort of summary of what the Big Well Survey was trying to achieve. Um, and back in 2016, actually, and, and it launched in 2017, um, Siren and I, so Siren's based down at, at UCL, um, buddied up with the Royal Entomological Society, who offered to fund some of the, um, the early work, and we, we set out to create the Big Wasp Survey. Um, a very simple survey. Uh, what we wanted people to do at the end of the summer, so what we did was the bank holiday weekend. So we had the bank holiday weekend. Um, sorry, I'm just closing something down here. So we had the bank holiday weekend set up as our, as our survey period, um, picked very deliberately. Um, it's a fairly quiet time of the year news-wise, so there's a good chance to get some stories out. Um, it's a very active time for um, wasps. It's generally a time when people are outside, so we thought it might be quite good for getting people to take advantage of their garden sites. But also from a biological perspective, um, our prediction was that we wouldn't catch very many queens at that time of the year of the species that we were interested in. So that was the prediction. Um, and that meant that the animals that we were tanking, because to do the big wasp survey, we were asking people to put out beer traps and the wasps fly in. You can see one on the screen here. The wasps fly in through this sort of funnel made with the top of the, 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 the bottle. Um, they fly in and then they drown in the beer. Um, so they will die. Um, and the reason why we do that is that that is a standard technique for um, trapping wasps. It's a very controllable technique. It's a very effective technique, but also we wanted to identify these wasps to species. And to do that, you need to look at them under a microscope. So we had to use a fatal trapping technique and we didn't want to catch too many queens because that would obviously have potential um, in reality, um, actually very little effect, but it has the potential to affect the population in the next, the next season. So that's when we, when we set it. And we set up a website and set up all kinds of bits and pieces in the background. And the idea was that people would put their traps out, the wasps would fly in, they would have them out for a set period of time, they would then prepare them. We had lots of videos to help people through. They basically um, put them through a sieve, um, give them a rinse, dry them off, stick them in a tin foil container, and then you stick them in a post, um, a free post address, which we'd also cleared with the post office so that they wouldn't be rolled flat. So I learned quite a lot about, about the postal system setting this project up. Uh, letters and envelopes are rolled before they, they go in to make them flat and to pack more in and so on. Um, but you can, through the miracle of, of technology, um, you can have sort of certain things put in. So letters that were addressed with our free post address would avoid the roller, which is good. Um, Leo agrees. So that's what we did. And we, we launched it. Um, we let out a press release. And I was quite excited because within a few hours of the press release going out, um, it was in The Guardian and The Telegraph and all sorts of other things. However, I have to say that when I first read the story, it was a little bit of a, um, a kick in the stomach because rather than people being delighted to take part, um, uh, Bug Life and a few other people had, had sort of uh, let out a statement that this was um, uh, a hateful survey um, promoting wasp killing, um, which was kind of interesting um, when it broke and it got picked up by lots of other people. It had two effects, really. The first effect was that my next two days were solidly spent on the radio, uh, mostly talking to all kinds of people um, about wasps, which was fantastic. Um, I, I remember having it. I, I got caught. I, I had a 6.30 morning um, slot. I think it was today or something. Um, at BBC Gloucestershire, which is just down the road from me. And I was supposed to come back. I had another one at eight. And then, you know, I had such and such going on. And, you know, the day was more or less clear because um, it was the summer. Uh, and I went down to Radio Gloucestershire at 6.30 and I didn't leave that studio until two o'clock because I kept getting called back to do more interviews. And then the drive home, I had to pull over about six times to do other interviews on my mobile phone, which was running out by, by this point. I actually got back here at half past four in the afternoon. Um, it, was, it was a crazy day, um, but it was wonderful because everybody I spoke to, I remember an interview with Richard Maybe, he was sort of saying, oh, this is ridiculous, isn't it? Tell us all about how you catch insects and how you have to identify them and what's going on and what's and, you know, it, it was really a very positive experience once I got over the original sort of um, gut punch. That was the first sort of um, effect. The second effect was that we filled up all of our surveying slots um, by about three o'clock that afternoon. Um, we had not really expected to get a great deal of interest in the first year. We didn't want thousands of people. We only wanted enough people to be able to cover the, the country. Um, and yeah, we thought we'd have to work really, really hard, but, but we didn't. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Uh, it actually then sort of launched a sort of mini cottage industry for the next year or so. Um, I pitched a couple of programmes to Radio 4 about looking at it because this is a big issue, right? And it's something as entomologists we have to own. Um, for us to identify 
many species and for us to survey many species currently, although eDNA and everything is very promising and it works very well in certain situations, we are currently left predominantly with often lethal trapping methods and um, ID that relies on, on having dead specimens. And, you know, that's an interesting sort of uh, aspect of entomology and something that, that we, you know, we would like to change, but it's not going to happen overnight. So I kind of pitched a, a program to Radio 4, which they were kind enough to commission, where we went and, and looked at, at the ethics of this. You know, what are the effects of it? How can we go about doing it? What are the alternatives? And that actually led into some really interesting conversations about whether insects can feel pain, um, which created a huge amount of material. So actually for World Service, I ended up doing a short series looking at some of these things and, and talking to people through throughout really the, the sort of entomological world about about this and what's really interesting is of course all the the personal turmoil that we as entomologists all go through over the fact that that mu you know much of what we have to do involves killing insects um so that was kind of interesting and we um Sarah and I got a, a nice piece into the conversation which was um into the independent and all that happened rather nicely for the second year so we got um some more publicity for it and we managed to fill up the empty slots that have become vacant so it was quite interesting, but then at the same time, um, working with some colleagues up in Yorkshire, up at the University of York, uh, we started to develop some scientific papers looking at the ethical landscape, looking at what we can do in terms of collecting. Um, other people were starting to look at the idea of insect pain. The, the day we published our paper, there was another paper that came out that, that actually was in an American journal of entomology was covering really quite similar things. It was really interesting, the sort of overlap between the different ideas. And I think we are starting to move towards a, a, a period of time where people are starting to think much more ethically about, about entomology and about what we do. Um, so, you know, that's the sort of some of the backstory to that. Um, what was really good, though, was that we ended up with plenty of wasps. And interestingly, although we ended up with thousands of wasps to identify, which was obviously a major problem, we didn't get one queen, not one. So these were all foragers at the end of their life. Absolutely zero impact on, on colonies next year, which was which was great. I mean, I think subsequently throughout the five years we've run, I think we've only had two queens that have been been caught in amongst the, the backdrop of them, which is great. But but of course, all of this success comes with it problems which need to be fixed. And the biggest problem is to identify all the wasps. So um, but the short term problem was to find enough freezer space for them. Um, so there were a lot of logistical uh, headaches we had to fix. Um, in all kinds of imaginative ways, but we ended up with lots and lots of specimens which were identified. We ran public workshops where people could come along um, and get some instruction and, and using microscopes and identifying insects, which is really, really interesting. And thanks to all of our partners for doing that, um, which was really, really nice. We also had lots of students helping out with this um, learning as we went. So I had, I had a couple of students who were doing a research project on, on trying to trying to get to grips with how people with very limited entomological experience actually engage with specimens and, and learn. You know, how, how do people learn these skills? How quickly can they pick them up and so on? So that was a really interesting kind of um, uh, situation. And we ended up with, uh, I think 2,300, and, oops, something's gone funny with my screen, but it seems to work. Um, 2,377 people registered. Um, uh, only about well a few of them that sort of 54 percent of them actually submitted data um and of those um a smaller number had wasps that were sent to um to university college london for identification but in total we had 559 traps out around the country um and we caught 6680 wasps and you can see our distribution there um across the country and we predominantly there were um quite a lot of um uh sort of uh, wasps that were identified in there. We had Vespida vulgaris, Germanica, and Vespa crabro. They were the, the, the three species, the, the social species that we were interested in. And you can see we've got really nice spread from there. You can see particularly the Vespa crabro kind of uh, the drop off line. I was in Staffordshire uh, a couple of weeks ago and we had lots of nice hornets around there. I have seen hornets actually when I was based in Sheffield um, and in Nottingham. I had hornets up around there, but um, we didn't get any in this in this particular year. Uh, most of them were vulgaris and Germanica. Um, but are the data any good, right? We've got a bunch of people all around the country sticking out beer bottles and sending them in and we're identifying them, you know, it's great, but actually are they any good? And what's really interesting is that we were able to do some, some fairly high level analysis with this and look at the data compared to some of the other data sets we've got. Um, so Bee Wars, for example, have a data set of, um, of wasps and Sorry, I can't see what's going on here. 
And if you look at their spatial uh, sort of approach and where they're sampling from, and you do a nearest neighbor analysis and work out how sort of dispersed they are and so on, you can compare their sampling here with a randomly distributed sample, which is what you'd be ideally aiming for. Um, and they're quite a long way off. Um, they're actually very heavily biased towards woodlands when you look at land use. Whereas when you look at the Big Wasp survey, although there is a bias actually in the survey data, we're, we're biased towards urban areas because you'd expect, you expect that with citizen science because you're, you're basically, you're biasing towards where people live, right? And people are sampling in their gardens. So you're biasing to a certain extent towards gardens, but actually the Big Wasp survey is much closer to a random distributed sample than, than the 40 years of, of bee wars, which was kind of interesting. So in terms of our sort of spatial bias, which was one of the criticisms I think people had, well, you're just, I, I actually had um, several people sort of rather angrily actually um, tell me, well, you're only gonna get people from gardens. It's a complete waste of time. Um, that's not true. Um, the data are extremely solid and what's more um, one year of sampling um, of the big Ross survey actually gave us and you can see from these um, the sort of talk through the maps they're, they're, they're there for you to look at um, you can see that that B wars managed to get sort of coverage and so on here we got the same level of data from one year of of citizen science data for you know outside with with beer bottles um as 40 years of, of long-term data collected by people that really knew what they were doing and identifying was very very time consuming um so this is a, an effective way of getting data both quickly and getting good data uh, which I won't say it was a surprise to us. We thought it would be a good system, but we didn't think it would be as good as this. Um, it really does turn out to be a very powerful way of gathering in. So citizen science can definitely work. It can work to create high quality data. We can certainly get media interest from it, <laughs> albeit initially as a consequence of some negative um, uh, sort of feedback for it. Um, the public don't mind killing insects for science actually there are plenty of people that are up for that they were wary about it they wanted to know the reasons behind it but once they understand it they're actually okay about it um our method doesn't have any effect on the population because we don't um, catch queens but also we've got a high level of participation or more accurately we got a high enough level of participation if we'd have required a hundred thousand people to put out traps we would probably be struggling but actually in order to get the coverage we didn't need that many people um, I've worked with other sort of uncharismatic species. So I did a flying ant survey for a few years back in 2012 was the first year. And yeah, we got, we got sort of 10,000 people or more every year contributing to that, but that was fairly straightforward. They just had to load up an app and say where they'd seen flying ant emergencies. Um, we did a spider stir survey over several years as well, looking at how spider sort of uh, presence in homes, a very pertinent topic right now. Um, and again, we got sort of tens of thousands of people engaged with that, but it was fairly straightforward. This is quite tricky. We're getting people to do actually quite a lot of stuff. Um, so it was surprising to us that people wanted to take part. And, and we've seen very limited drop off in retention. Um, those people are super samplers, as we call them. They've stayed with us and they email us and ask us for updates. And we, we are in touch with them constantly. And we, you know, we, we well, not constantly because that would be a bit annoying, but we, <laughs> we give them updates when we can. Um, but those people have stayed with us. They do samples with us. And every so often we do a little extra recruitment drive and particularly focused. So we had a few holes, for instance, that we could um, address by going on some local radio stations. But it, it's really, really worked. And, you know, I spoke when we started. I spoke to a couple of people who are quite well known in citizen science for ecology, and um, both of them said that, you know, they didn't think this would work. And we kind of said, yeah, we're not totally sure it's going to work either. Um, but it did work. And I think probably one of the main reasons it did work was because of, um, of that you know, original negative publicity. Uh, it, it really gave us a platform to, to talk about entomology and to, talk, and to be upfront about what entomology involves and to talk about wasps. So hopefully, you know, we're trying to at least um, develop a bit more of a public understanding. It's given us a bit more of a platform. I've got a student at the moment that's studying the media stories on wasps over the last decade and trying to see if there's been any shift, if, if actually what we're saying about wasps is filtering through. Um, at the moment, it does look as though um, the media stories on wasps are predominantly getting more positive. Um, very early days looking at the data. Uh, very early sort of stories, you know, 10 years ago, not that early is it, but you know, 10 years ago, stories would usually be wasps are a complete waste of time, they spoil picnics and everything, and then you'd get a line at the bottom, oh, but they're actually very important, says blah, blah, from wherever. Um, there are more stories now that are sort of 
front and centering the fact that actually we should, you know, reasons why we should love wasps uh, is, is the, the headline of one and, and so on. So there does seem to be a general shift towards that. But as anyone that spends any time on Twitter will appreciate, there's an awful lot of negative media and press stories about about invertebrates particularly i mean this time of year is crazy isn't it first of all crane flies are invading right <laughs> very fast and loose way of using the word invade um they're crane flying there and then of course there's the myth oh they can bite you they, you know they've got the most amazing venom but but they can't break the skin which is just a conflation of so many different things it takes 20 minutes to unpick how on earth people got there but you'll still see it published and then and then we have house spiders coming out which apparently are um, someone found a spider in Stroud, where, where was it? I can't remember, Some, somewhere around here, Tetbury it was. Um, and they claimed it was eight inches across. They had a photograph of it in, a, in an el <laughs> yeah, they had a photo of an electrical junction box. It was, it was just a regular sized house spider, but you know, this was an eight inch tropical spider that was invading. All of that silliness. Then of course we get all the silliness around ladybirds um, invading, coming in and so on. So we, we get this end, and then of course there's jellyfish and sharks. Oh, no, there's no spider in here, Leo. Well, there might be, but we'll be all right. Um, so yeah, there's all this kind of craziness in the media. So I'm, I'm, I'm actively looking at, at sort of kind of quantify some of that craziness and, and get to the bottom of it. Um, but we had a major problem last year, um, as indeed did, did the entire world, in that, that COVID hit. And it was about uh about the second week of lockdown i think that Sue and i had a phone call and we had children at home and getting on top of all the rest of the nonsense and we're like we can't we can't run the big wash service it's, it's too much we can't do it you know there's no way of us doing it we don't know post offices will be open yeah i can't even i could barely focus on um you know doing what i was supposed to be doing let alone anything else sorting out free post and all of that we couldn't have i we, we didn't know we'd be able to have id workshops because at the time you know no one could even mix so we could end up with a whole bunch of dead wasps that just rot somewhere which is you know not an ethical way to proceed so we just said let's let's call it and then about a week later we sort of you know once we realized that actually you know the world would <laughs> could, could function um we came up with a plan and the plan was that we would get people to identify their own specimens, um, which would actually be a godsend for us if they could, because the major headache that we had was processing samples, finding a sponsor for free post, you know, thanks to the Royal Entomological Society for that. But, you know, we, we couldn't be going on that way. Um, and then you've got to store them and then you've got to work, organize workshops, which is a nightmare because you've got to book space and get everything moved in. Then you've got to get people signed up for it. You know, it's, it becomes a full time job trying to just do this one thing. So if people could identify their own, then that would be great. Um, they could just run everything themselves. But we had no idea if they would be into it. Um, but they were. We emailed them. It was incredible. We emailed, I think, 1,600 people that were our super samplers sort of set by that point. Um, and it was it was crazy. Um, the guy that's our webmaster, Chris, sort of, it was about three hours later, just said, I've had 650 responses. Everyone's up for it. And we're like, no, 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 this auto replies or deleted accounts. He's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it was just this great untapped sort of, yeah, people were desperate to do stuff. And we emailed them saying, look, we want you to put traps up, but then we want you to do all this stuff. We're going to support you through it. We're going to have online videos, but it's going to be a challenge. You know, we weren't sort of backwards in, in, in coming forwards about how tough it would be. And they were absolutely, absolutely up for it. So I had a master's student, Jess Perry, um, she set about doing just a fantastic set of online resources to talk people through the identification of these wasps from start to finish. Um, all of the features you have to look for, how to do it with a magnifying glass, how to set up, um, you know, optics in ways that allow you to see these things, you know, using binoculars the wrong way around and all of that stuff. Right. If you don't have any specialist kit and so on. And it worked. And bizarrely, not only did it work, it worked better than when we went to all the faff of doing all the workshops. This was a better system. 90% um, of people pretty much said they enjoyed doing it. But when they sent back their, we, we got a quite a big sample of survey, sample of them to send their samples into us directly so that we could check them. Um, because obviously, you know, we didn't, well, it's not that we didn't trust people, right? You've got to validate data for citizen science. Um, when, we, when we got them back, they 96% of the identifications that were made by people were correct. When we run the workshops and did some validation, it was only 86%. So when people can work on their own at their own pace without some scientist standing over their shoulder in a white coat, right? People are actually better. They're about 10 percentage points better 
when they're left to their own devices. Um, they gain confidence. That confidence is linked to their ability and skill. Um, so we wrote this up anyway. It was in um, ecological entomology. I'm sorry, insect conservation and diversity um, a month or so ago. It was a very successful way of doing it. It increased accuracy. People seem to enjoy it. We got higher sort of participant enjoyment from it than running the workshops and it released us from having to do it. So this online form of identification is really potentially very, very useful. However, I mean, there's some caveats with this. Um, one of the caveats being that uh, we already had people that were really engaged with the process. They've been sampling wasps for us for five years. Um, I don't know if you could go in, go in sort of straight uh, without that history and, and get such a, a good feedback. But, but the other thing is, of course, the, the Vespine wasps are, are relatively straightforward. Um, we had a limited number of species, right? We, we knew what species were, you know, it's basically <laughs> Vulgaris germanica, Vespa crabro. Um, they're, they're, they're the most, most you know, that's predominantly what we're getting. And they're relatively, in inverted commas, simple to distinguish. You have to look at them and you have to know what you're looking at. And it takes a little while to get your sort of groove on for it. Um, but once you do, they're relatively straightforward. And, and we actually tested people with some images before and some images after, and we could see, we could see that they had improved and, and all of that. But, but really the, the level of accuracy they were achieving from, from doing it themselves without us, I think there's a white coat effect. You know, I think, I think people were, I think, I think people were just sort of, I mean, they may have been intimidated in some way that they, they weren't able to just spend their own time. There's something, there's something about just being able to do it in your own time without that pressure. I think that really, really sort of gels with something like identification where, you know, it's, some people find it easy. Some people find it hard. It takes a while to manipulate, you know, some people are incredible at manipulating things with their fingers and, and forceps and stuff. Some people aren't, you know, they're just, allowing people a space to do that but supporting them with videos and so on just seems to be really effective but yeah obviously for things where you have to start dissecting genitals and stuff you know probably not going to work but for other things it can do and i think sometimes as entomologists we can be a little bit snifty about about all of this quite a you know quite a lot of things can be accurately identified from photographs um quite a lot of things can be accurately identified simply by looking at them or looking at certain features. Yes, it can get very, very tricky. And yes, there are some groups that are all next to impossible, but they're not all like that. Um, and there's a lot of potential, I think, to bring people on board with this process. Um, so, yeah, uh, if you want to get involved with the Big Wasp Survey, we are always on the lookout for recruits. Um, it will run in August bank holiday in 2022. Um, we've, we've got a system now where we can sort of work out yeah, you know, if, if you apply and we know where you are because you give us your postcode and stuff, uh, we can let you know and say, actually, you know what, we've already got enough samples from the area, but thank you very much. Or we might get in touch and say, it's fantastic that you've got in touch because actually what we need is someone to put a trap out over here or some other such thing. So please do get involved. Go to bigwallsurvey.org. You can also get some updates of things as we go along. And um, just a few acknowledgements to people. I mean, first of all, of course, to thank the members of the UK public that have helped us to gather the data, um, thanking all those people over the last few years that have sorted them out. Big thanks now to the, the, the super samplers that we've got who, are, who have been sorting them out this year and, and last year. Um, thanks to the Natural History Museum as well for hosting some of those things. Um, big thanks to Stuart Roberts and B-Walls um, for giving us access to their data and for being supportive of the project. Um, various other people there, I won't go through everyone. Um, and then also that public perception study that was um, that was done earlier. That's work that was done through um, University College London um, with Siri, and I wasn't involved with that work, but um, but you know I think it's beholden to thank uh, the the 740 people, 748 people actually that took part in that too, um, because when you want to survey the public to find out how the public feel about insects, you need to ask some quite detailed questions. And actually, it's not just a case of do you like wasps, yes or no. Um, if we want to get into that sort of um, space and work out what people actually think um, it's a little bit more involved and you know with that in mind just sort of kicking ahead to some of the future work I've already mentioned some of the things that we're going to be doing but one of the things I'm really hoping to do through um, Daphne mentioned earlier on about the fact that I chair the RES's outreach committee and one of the bits of research that we're hoping to do um, in collaboration with a, um, a couple of sort of um, visitor venues actually is to find people that don't like insects right there's no point in asking people that like insects why they like insects we need to find the people that absolutely hate insects and sit down with them and spend a bit of time because I you know what we, we, what we want to find out is is why they don't like insects what it is about insects they don't like but also you know test around a few stories and a few ideas 
can you win someone over to the side of wasps by by telling them that they're pest controllers or actually do people not care? Um, generally speaking, people don't particularly care about agriculture. They don't particularly care about pest management. I'm trying to get people interested in soils is about probably about the, the, the next hardest thing, um, which are you know, incredibly important, but but much undervalued. So, you know, we, we need to find out what sort of stories and, and how we can frame those stories to try and get people on board, because currently we don't really actually know. And you know, whether we like it or not, public pressure, political pressure, all of these things that's what drives stuff forward so if we want to change the world we need to understand the world that we're changing but we also need to understand those pressure points and, and what people think so that's where we're where we're heading with it um thank you very much for listening um I'm, i hope it hasn't been too disturbing having a burbling three-year-old in the background um i will unshare my screen now if that's all right uh he says with confidence that it's not there we go. I will unshare my screen. And if anyone wants to ask any questions, I've yeah, I'm, I've got 10 minutes or so. I'm very happy to um, to have a chat. But just bear in mind, I'm sure Daffod will remind you as well that, that we are recording this session. Ah, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, do you, uh, when people uh, set up their wasp trap in the garden, do, do you get non wasps in the trap? Yes, um, we do, uh, which is you know the bycatch problem. Um, sometimes it's not much of a problem at all. Um, sometimes it can be quite an excessive problem, actually. Um, and we've, we've had people, we, we've shut people down before. They, they'll sort of write back after an hour or so. And again, there's, there's loads of flies piling and we just go like, just, just tank the trap. <laughs> we don't need to do that. In, in general, the bycatch levels are not massively high, but they're they are high. Um, we, we've tried to, to use them where we can. So we've sent all sorts of samples of things. Um, certainly there were a few beetles, not many, but a few that we caught, which were of, of importance. So we sent those off. Um, it is mostly dipter. And we have done a study where we've looked at bycatch. We're just looking at how to analyze that now because it's proved to be more, more tricky than we thought. Um, looking at different types of liquids. So we, we said to people, for instance, use beer, you know, but you can use lager or ale or, you know, cider, or you can use fruit juice if, if you prefer. Um, so what we try to do is to see whether or not one of those fluids has fewer bycatch than um, than others, uh, which is something we're looking into. So, yeah, the, the bycatch is a problem for a lot of these trapping methods, and it's yeah, it's something we, we are working on. Um, one of the things that, that you can do um, is to is to to get those bycatch to people so you get some research value out of them. But one of the, the big problems with that, of course, is that, you know, if you speak to someone and go, right, we've gone through a load of wasp traps and we've got, you know, we've got about a thousand different types of flies that have been caught from different locations and they're all catalogued, you know, but we don't know what they are. Um, are you interested? And of course, there's a there, there's then a, a major, <laughs> you know, you're basically just giving someone a big identification headache that they don't necessarily need. So I think one of the things that that we can probably do across the board, actually, when we're doing this type of sampling, not just for the big wasp survey, but is and it's one of the recommendations of that paper I was talking about is to is to in advance understand what sort of bycatch you're going to get from your technique and then buddy up with researchers so that that you've got a, a, a sort of pathway to get that bycatch out i think one of the issues about bycatch is that we don't talk about it enough um if you look at sort of published results you know pan yeah you know, we went pan trapping for solitary bees and you'll read it all the solitary bees they found and everything and and there's no mention whatsoever of any bycatch it's as if it's as if a, a, a white pan trap magically filters out anything that's not the, the the thing you're looking at um i think it is something that as entomologists we probably need to be much more upfront about and to try and find ways around it but yeah i was i was surprised it wasn't as high as, as we were as we were we were fearing but it does seem to be very localized and i assume that's just well, that's the nature of the beast, isn't it? Mm. So it certainly seems from your talk that citizen science is actually a lot more a lot more important than I I I, I personally had considered in the past. Yeah, um, I, it's um, it's it's a remarkable approach when you get the data that you need. I, I, it'll take me too long to load it up, but you know that that flying ant survey I talked about, we did it for three years across the country. Um, you know, you can build up such a rich data set that we were able to build up whether we, we had enough data that we could back check every single day of the season with the nearest Met office. It was a huge that we had to actually employ someone to do the data in the end because we were well out of our depth. But but you can come up with weather predictors and, and really 
close models that completely predict these these things to a surprising degree. And actually, after the paper came out, um, one of the electricity generating um, people got in touch and asked if they could talk more about it because they were interested in whether or not flying ant emergencies could be um, could be you know used in their giant model of how much people use electricity in some way and stuff. So it is it is a problem. The biggest problem, I suppose, or the two big problems, is that your your participants usually reflect where people live and that can be a problem um so you look at our flying ant data for example um you'd be you, you can identify every major conurbation in britain from the, the clustering of the points um and then the second big problem is validating the data now with something like flying ants there's not too many things you can mistake the emergence from uh we got lots of people to send us samples in you know please collect five flying ants and and we'll identify them they were virtually all laceous niger I think 98% of them were laceous in general. Um, but yeah, validating, validating data. When you're asking people to do something a little bit more complex, that data validation is, is key. But actually when we've done it, it turns out people are pretty good. <laughs> you know, they're actually, they're actually pretty good when you give them a, a chance. Um, are there any, um, any questions from anyone else? Just around the screen. Um, Carol Neal has commented on uh, uh, what the origin of the stitches remarks. Were. Yeah, um, I, I was interested when I saw that because it's it's a very it's a very distinct word. It's you know I, d I don't know what I mean. I, I wasn't I'm not sure, Carol, what you mean by um, what, what's what's your what what's the linkage there with with wasp spiders. You can put um put that on the chat um would it be sort of how about stitches after you get stung by was <laughs> yeah I, I wondered if it I, that was my initial um sort of interpretation but um i've been stung by by wasps a fairly large number of times and i <laughs> i don't remember um ever ever looking like i might need stitches but yeah i i, I mean the other thing is i I suspect that a lot of people, I wonder how many people have actually been stung by wasps. This was another study that we were looking to try and do at one point, but it, it sort of got lost a bit. But, but we don't really, as, as a medical phenomenon, we don't actually know that much about, about the prevalence of stings. Um, we don't know that much about how people have been stung and, and what, what the perceived sort of problem is. Um, so I got stung uh, for a, a TV thing a while ago on my hand and um, and it was fine. Like actually, when, when it's a weird thing about it is that when you're expecting the the, the pain and you're kind of okay about it and stuff, it, it, they're not objectively. It's not that painful, right? It's 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 if you're flapping around and stuff, and then they suddenly go in, you you kind of it's a bit different. But when you're expecting, it's all right. And I was actually that's fine. And I was driving home, and I kind of noticed that you know my hand felt a bit warm, and I sort of looked at it, and it <laughs> in 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 sort of about an hour after the event. Um, it had swollen up to twice its normal size and I had a hand like a boxing glove, um, which was really odd. And I've not had that reaction before. I felt fine otherwise. Um, but but I haven't been stung subsequently to that. So I'm hoping that it wasn't the beginning of developing a, a reaction. But but we don't know that much about about whether people have been stung and about the sort of you know people's reaction to them and stuff. So I think that would be quite interesting. Mm. Um, David Lonsdale has his hand up for, to ask a question. Yes, I, I was impressed with your graph showing how well distributed your participants were as compared with the bee wall especially. Yeah, I, we were surprised by that, yeah. I'm I just wondering though, if um, if quite a large proportion of those are running their beer traps in their own gardens, is there a bias towards wasps that tend to nest in and around houses? Yes, um, I think, uh, and that is one of the one of the issues of uh, of the study yeah I, I think that that suburban bias that we have um sort of weak suburban bias i think is is a potential problem and we've one of the things we've done this year which i didn't sort of mention but we, we ran a pilot study where we had a few of a few uh, several hundred of our people um do the same thing in june to see whether or not we were just missing out on we were expecting a few other species of vespula to come out and dolico vespula which are completely not uh really pretty much not represented at all and we wondered it are we just too late in the season um are these wasps not attracted to wasp traps which doesn't seem that likely but i guess it's possible or as you've pointed out is it actually a, a geographical bias or a, more like a habitat bias 
Um, so hopefully we'll get a little bit more insight into that. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, it's something that we're trying to we're trying to fix by sort of having uh, a few more or a few well. We don't want fewer suburban sites, but we do want more non-suburban sites. So um, a little bit of targeted kind of recruitment um, is, is in the future for this, I think. Uh, Marcy Anderson has asked, what do you put on a wasp sting to make it less hurtful? Vinegar. Uh, and uh, vinegar. Vinegar, yeah. Vos, vos, vos for vinegar and bicarbonate for bees. That's how I remember it. So yeah, if you if you can get vinegar on a wasp sting straight away, it does actually take quite a lot of the sting. But there's um there's uh I forget what it's called. It's called waspies, isn't it? That's um that works very well as well. Okay. So um so do wasps have um, all the wasps have the same venom, or does it vary with species? Uh, yeah, it does. I believe it does vary with species, but I think some of the the main um, large molecules and stuff are broadly similar um but i think yeah there are some there are some variations across the board and obviously once you get into different genera i think they have they have different venoms as well and they certainly feel different um i was stung by a polybia which is a tropical wasp species uh it was a, it was clumsy really um i was watching them sort of fly in direct lines they're obviously going out of their nest and i watched them for a while and i thought oh, that's cool they're going across a path in panama and then I, I don't know <laughs> just decided to walk straight across their path which which was foolish and uh three of them ended up in my hair and stung me and it was uh incredible i sort of i didn't exactly black out but i kind of the pain was just bizarrely intense for about two seconds um, and I actually ended up kneeling on the floor and then it was completely gone. Um, after about 10 seconds, I sort of stood up and, and, and moved off quickly and thought, what on earth was that all about? Um, so that was a very different experience. There's the, the Schmidt mm. pain index. I'm sure people have come across before. Um, Justin Schmidt <laughs> describes these different experiences in sort of wine tasting terms almost um, and then rates the pain. Uh, and yeah, you look through the different wasps and actually the Vespine wasp rates fairly highly. Um, I think he describes it as something like a, um, holding a burning match or something. Um, but yeah, the, the, the sort of different, the different sort of ways he describes the pain uh, does reflect my experience of being stung by them, which of course reflects the biochemistry of the, of the venom itself. Mm. Um, and um, well, if, if I can ask one final question, um, yeah. but are there any other um, insect species that you think this kind of study will be appropriate for? Yeah, um, I, and that's a that's a great question, and it's one that I've been I've been sort of pondering on because what you want is a it, well, first of all, you want a species that we need to find out more about. But actually, to be honest, that's pretty much all of them. <laughs> um, so there's that. You you need something that people can have a reasonable stab at identifying. Um, so you want a, a group that's reasonably constrained. Um, I think in terms of sort of fatal, um, you know, lethal trapping. Um, yeah, that, that becomes, I think, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue, but certainly sort of pan trapping for solitary bees and so on could be something. The problem with solitary bees is that some of them are really easy to identify. Yeah, also being a reefer bimbling around, Andrina cinerea, you know, you know, you know what you're dealing with. Um, but some of them are incredibly difficult. And I see lots of photos posted on Twitter of, of sort of solitary bees. And, and I'm always proud when I go, yeah, that's Andrina. No idea which one of the many, but, <laughs> but that's the genus. Um, they, they would be more tricky because I think there's 256 of them or something. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, but I think I think there are definitely some groups out there that people could start doing some some identification for. But yeah, at the moment we're we're sort of we're, we're, we're focusing and sticking with the wasps. But I think I think there's some opportunities. I wonder actually with crane flies. I know there's I think there's 335 different types of tipulid fly, which is obviously too many. But actually, this time of year, there seem to be in my back garden at least, you know, three or four dominant species. So I do wonder whether there may be something that we could do along those lines, because, you know, they are something that needs yeah, it needs some positive publicity and of course without them you know a great many birds would make it through the winter and I, and I know a lot of migratory birds top up on them as well so they are an important part of all of that so yeah maybe we can maybe we can champion crane flies next who knows mm, okay or may bugs or, or moths even yes yeah yeah well moths would be great to get people involved with um but <laughs> they can be yeah, they're, they're, some, are, some are straightforward and, and then a lot are, are very tricky. We, we, we tried, we, we started thinking about a citizen science campaign actually with moth. I'll just leave you with this, with this story. We, uh, I got some students to try and develop a five pound moth trap. 
because obviously most people are not going to go and invest in a load of moth traps and LEDs are pretty bright these days. Could we develop a moth trap for five pounds? We, we work with the Cheltenham Science Festival and we, I think it's a B&Q bucket, the cheapest possible lampshade, if I remember rightly, and a, and a one pound torch, which was actually very bright and, and stuff with a balloon over the top. And we put them out, not expecting to get much. They're brilliant at attracting moths. You get plenty of them. The problem is they're mostly micro moths or, or sort of, you know, little brown jobs. And we had a, a series of people that we were surveying and we said, you know, how interested are you in moths and everything? And we asked them all the questions. Then we showed them some of the images of the moths. And then later on, we asked them how interested they were in moths. And actually looking at the moths that they would have captured in their five pound trap, th there was a significant drop off in interest in moths. So we, we sort of ditched the idea because the, the whole point was to get people more enthused and engaged about moths. And it seemed to have the opposite effect. But but yeah, there's that. They are they are a group with some fascinating stories to tell. So there's definitely some some opportunity there. Okay, <clears throat> right. So we're just over the um, six o'clock um, <clears throat> watershed, as it were. Um, so um, uh, thank you very much for pleasure. Uh, thank you. A great presentation, and and to your daughter as well for. Chipping in, <laughs> it was, it was my, my 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 long haired son. Yeah, he was. <laughs> he was he was largely quiet, so that's good. All right, okay, right, okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you. And, Pleasure and to let's, you, everyone. Right. So, um, and goodbye. I guess um, we can close the meeting. Thanks very much again. Brilliant. Thank you.